This is God's word and we give him thanks for it. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. That the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion you will inherit. When they were but few in number, few indeed and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles, his neck was put in irons, till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him, the ruler of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel entered Je Egypt. Jacob resided as a foreigner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes whose hearts he turned to hate his people, to conspire against his servants. He sent Moses his servant, and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark, for had they not rebelled against his words? He turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die, their land teemed with frogs, which went up into the bedrooms of their rulers. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail, hail with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. They ate up every green thing in their land. He ate up the produce of their soil. Then he struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their manhood. He brought out Israel laden with silver and gold and from among their tribes no one faltered. Egypt was glad when they left because dread of Israel had fallen on them. He spread out as a cloud, a cloud as a covering, and a fire to give light at night. They asked and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing. His chosen ones with shouts of joy, he gave them the lands of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for, that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. As we come to his word, maybe you'd like just to take a moment in your own heart, just to pray to him, to ask him to speak to you today, to bring even to him how you are today, and ask that he might speak. So I'll just allow you a moment to pray quietly in your own heart. Lord, we come today to your word and ask that you might speak to us. Open our ears that we might hear and our hearts that we might receive your word. That we might trust you and walk in your ways. We give you thanks. Amen. How will you remember 2023? No doubt you've got good things to remember last year. Moments that you want to hang on to. You don't want to lose them. But they're not the only moments of last year, are they? Times of weeping, times of being up against it, times of wondering are you ever going to make it through, times you'd rather forget. 
On New Year's Eve as a family, we uh, got our family photo album out, which was our our phones. Um, <laughs> my phone, Ali's phone, and Anna now has a phone, and we we shared some of our favourite pictures from the year on the TV, and we just looked at what the year had been, and we'd forgotten so much of it actually. There've been so many good moments, but our phones they also they allow us the opportunity to delete photos. I wonder what memory you might like to delete from last year, what you might like to forget. The message of this psalm, this song of God's people that they would sing together in the temple was one of remembering so that they could move forward. They sang to each other what God had done so that they could trust him going forward. They're called to remember. In verses 1 to 4 here, you'll see they're called to praise, to sing, to sing, to glory, to look to him, to his name, who he is and who he has shown himself to be in his works. This is a psalm of praise. They're called to remember in verses 5 to 7, his works, his wonders, miracles, judgments. So in many ways, this is a psalm which is about history. Um, it's written so that God's people can remember him. But in verse 8, if you look with me, we see that God remembers them. He is faithful. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the path he swore to Isaac. Verse 10, he confirmed it to Jacob as a degree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. God remembers the promise he made to them to give them a home. He was bringing them to their own land, to their inheritance in Canaan. He remembers his promise, but he also remembers his people. His promise is made with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. An agreement between him and his chosen people. He's not going to break this. It's an everlasting covenant, he says. They can trust it. But God doesn't just promise his people a home and then just give it to them, um, getting the job done. His faithfulness isn't just functional, keeping to the letter of his word, but it's relational. Through every twist and turn and up and down of their journey, he is with them. It's a covenant, not a contract. A few years ago, we bought a car as a family that it was the first car I had with one of those electronic handbrakes. Um, and I'd be honest, I wasn't very good with it for quite a while. Um, the, the dealer who sold it to me gave me a six month warranty. And he had, I had the word, his word that if it broke down, he'd fix it. So when I kept pulling on the ele electronic handbrake too early and it triggered the warning signs, I had to bring it into him. And he kept his word. He, he kept it. But he didn't know me. It was a business transaction. I'd given him money. He'd given me the car. It was a contract. When I married Ali, it was a different story. We made promises to each other. A lifelong relationship of loving one another through ups and downs, twists and turns, looking after one another. That's a covenant. God relates to his people through a covenant. We read in verse 10 here, it won't be broken. And what follows is, is if you like pictures of that in their family photo album. It covers the period from Abraham and the patriarchs through to entering the promised land. And we go on this journey down memory lane with God's people. And we see that God protects his people and his promises every chapter of the story. History for Israel was his story. It's told here from the perspective of what God was doing. And throughout the songs in this book of the Psalms, the fourth book of the Psalms, um, it's split into different books. We've this uh, little phrase that keeps recurring, the Lord reigns. God is the one in control and at work. And we see that here. He's at work with a purpose to protect his people. Look at me at verse, look with me at verses 12 to 15. Um, they're small beginnings. 
They're moving around, living in tents. They're in the land, actually, but they don't own any of it. They are aliens. They lack the rights and protections of the inhabitants. They're small in number. They're vulnerable, but God protects them. He rebukes kings for their sake. Actually, we're taken back to the story here of Abraham. Abraham does this twice in his life. He pretends that his wife is his sister. Um, he, he did it the first time with Pharaoh, and then he does it a second time with Abimelech, but God steps in. And in Genesis 20, verse 3, we read this. God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You're as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now return the man's wife. He is a prophet. He will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all who belong to you will die. God had to step in because Abraham was being so foolish, but God protected him and his promise. The threat of Pharaoh, of Abimelech, hung over God's people. But right through this psalm, we see the threat of powerful rulers. Verse 18 and 19, there's Potiphar who puts Joseph in prison. Now years pass and in verse 23 we've got Israel who moved to Egypt and Pharaoh is over them. They're hated and they're oppressed. Verse 44, when they, even when they move into the land, it's not a land that's, it's not a new build. It's not all theirs, it actually belongs to other people. Other people who, um, yes, they would have to um, engage with. Mighty men and even giants, we read off, that towered over them. They are threatened at every turn by others more powerful than they are. Yet they are protected every step by the one who is more powerful than any other. But it's not just they who are protected. He protects, God protects his promises. The promises weren't just threatened by the power of others, but by their own foolishness, just as I described there with Abraham. But God still works to keep his promises, but he does it in the strangest of ways. Maybe you picked up on some of that in the psalm. When they face famine, in verse 16, we read that he called it down. When Joseph is mistreated by his brothers and sold as a slave, and imprisoned, we read in verse 17 that God is at work. He was sending this man ahead. You might remember the words in the Joseph story. Genesis 45 verse 5, Joseph says, And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead. Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, You intended to harm me. <laughs> He was been real about it, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. God is sovereign over their story. He chooses to bring them through hard circumstances, yet cares for them. Their path is far from smooth or plain sailing, but they are safe because God is protecting them. We read here too, they find themselves in Egypt, far from the home God had promised them. It seems like a backward step. They're hated and oppressed, far from the rest God had promised them. And in verse 25 again, we read that God turned the hearts of the Egyptians to hate the people. So even the opposition was in God's hands. But he's doing this so that he would deliver them with mighty signs and wonders that he showed up and showed himself to be their rescuer. We read here of how the plagues were not just a matter of one disaster after another falling in this nation. That's what it might have felt like to them. But it was actually God's <coughs> hand judging them. He broke their power in the end. Verse 36, tragically striking down their firstborn. Because they would not yield or listen to him he did this to rescue his people verse 37 to bring them out he protected them and the promise to bring them home so then we're out in the clear from Egypt and we see in verses 39 to 41 
that he covers them with a cloud. He provides food that they need. He provides water for them. And this is how we remember the wilderness years. <laughs> Yet when you read the story of those years, God's people are grumbling and complaining. And yet what's remembered here is his goodness to them. Verse 42, he remembered his promise. He gives them the land, verse 44. His people and his promises face threat, but he brings them safe home. He remembered. Christmas tree's still up here. I have to confess ours is still up at home as well. I don't know if Christmas is behind you or if you feel you're still coming out of it. But in the Christmas season, we remember how Jesus came to save us, how God remembered us. Luke chapter 1 and verse 72, Zachariah, his song, he speaks and it says this, God has acted to show mercy to our ancestors, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. To remember his promises. God doesn't forget, (laughs) by the way. But remember means something particular. It it means that he is actively keeping that promise. He's choosing to save his people. And that is what he does in sending Jesus for us. He promised Abraham a blessing. To make a people from him. And to give him a land, a home that they could call their own. And he remembered these promises when he sent his son. In Jesus, we have the fulfillment of that thousands of years later. God has remembered us in sending Jesus. Each of us are made by God to be at home with him. And yet, and yet each of us have strayed. Just as the earliest story in the Bible shows in Adam and Eve, we choose our own way. We we become separate from God, estranged from him, banished from him. Our sin means we are far from home. And yet Jesus died in our place to take our sin and bring us to God. In 1 Peter 3.18 we read that he brings us home to him when we trust in him. He suffered for us that he might bring us to God. In John 14.23 we read that Jesus says, anyone who loves me and obeys my teaching, my father will love them. And we'll come to them and make our home with them. Jesus has come to make his home with us. It's not always possible for us to be home at Christmas time. We thought a little bit about this last month. Wherever we might think of as home. Because home can be found in many different places, can't it? And for quite a few of us here in this church family, quite a few of the adults... We have either lived away from here or as we live here, we're living away from where we grew up. And I think when you do that, you begin to find home in different places, don't you? Um, And in different ways. You have a broader understanding of home. But you also know what it is to be homesick. To yearn and long for somewhere that you're not anymore. In some ways, the Bible describes our current condition as humans as a homesickness. Even as Christians, we're described as people who are far from home. We are exiles. As Peter writes in 1 Peter, which we read from earlier this morning, in chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In other words, don't make yourself too cosy and at home here because you're you're built for somewhere else. We don't belong here and yet God is working to bring us home and establishing a home here even as we feel in exile. In the letter of 1 Peter, we studied actually um, in life groups before Christmas, the safe place and the sense of home they were defined was in this kind of gathering, it was with other Christians that God was building a home and actually extending that to others who might trust in him. So maybe for you at the moment, in your far from home moments as followers of Jesus, you might 
be reminded that he can be trusted to bring us home. That what the, the, um, the trajectory of this psalm, a God who brings his people home, who protects them each step, he's still doing that with us. He can be trusted to keep us and bring us home. Yes. He protects us and his promises every chapter <coughs> of our story. It's not reason to give thanks. It's not reason to trust him. And last Sunday we took some time to look back and give thanks for last year. And as you do that, it, and as we do that, it helps us forward, doesn't it? God has provided and protected. God has been present with us. Even in the parts of your 2023 that you wouldn't have chosen, you wouldn't have written. Even in those parts, can we recognise how he's continued with us? Steps on the way that may feel like backwards ones, but actually he has been faithful and he will bring us safe home. So we want to go forward trusting him, but also obeying him. At the end of this psalm, we read this, that they would keep his laws. And throughout this psalm, God's people are referred to as his chosen or his servant. God calls us to himself so that we might live fully and freely for him. He has remembered us and kept us so that we would remember him by walking in his ways into this year. Let's do that, um, trusting in him today. Let's pray. All our lives, Lord, you have been faithful and you have been so, so good. Lord, would you give us eyes to see that? <coughs> would you give us hearts to, to, to really feel that and mouths to sing it? And Lord, as we step forward into this year, we pray that you would give us that real sense of safety and of home here with this church family and with other Christians, but also might we be extending that invitation to come home to you, to others that we meet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.